Hi everyone and welcome back. This is Jackie from the Spare Room Studio. Today I'm going to show how I use the Faber-Castell Albrecht Durer watercolour pencils. And I'm doing this because a few people had mentioned they'd like to see how they are used. And um, especially for Candace at Happy Catastrophe. Um, and I think somebody had asked about how I would use watercolour pencils for portraits. So I'm going to have a go at doing this for you. And we'll just have to ignore that telephone going. So I'm going to start with using the water brush like I would normally. Now I do have a um, pot of brushes here and some water just in case I decide to show you that way. But really the concept's the same, whether it's a water brush or whether I'm using a regular brush, I would still attack it in the same manner. So um, to start with, I like to build the layers up lightly with watercolour because uh, the, the concept of watercolour is that instead of using white, and you can use white, it doesn't mean that you can't, but instead of using white, um, you should try to preserve some white of the paper to shine through um, instead of using an opaque white paint. And um, I chose to do this book. It's the Wild, Wildflower Folk from Christine Karen. And she's really kindly put in a lot of grayscale that shows you exactly where you're going to need some shadows and that if you're new to portrait work Christine's work is great because she does do that and it gives you some ideas of where to put shadows and so what I'm using to start with is brown ochre this this picture is called troll girl so I'm not necessarily going to end up going for a really realistic um, human type skin colour, although it may end up that way. I have absolutely no plans at this stage. But um, I am thinking sort of in my head, if she's a troll girl and she's got sticks and leaves and feathers and stuff in her hair, she's very much of nature. And so therefore I'm thinking sort of warm, um, golden brown sort of tones makes a good start. So I'm thinking like, you know, those, those highlighted areas, I don't want them to be any darker than that now. Um, I haven't left any white because when you look at somebody's face, you don't necessarily see white highlights, but it's very, very pale on those areas. So we'll let that dry. It shouldn't take too long because I haven't saturated the, water, uh, the page this time with water. In fact, I'm not really using a lot of water. It's just what's coming out of the water brush on its own. So this first sort of um, layer is really just setting that base and trying to remember, don't go too dark because we want to try and sort of preserve some sort of highlights. Now, if I go too, <coughs> pardon me, if I go too heavy, I can bring in some white pencil or um, acrylic paint or an opaque um, gouache, 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 um, you know, or something like that. There's no one, you know, there's no rule to say you can't do that. But I'm going to try and avoid it if I can because I think it just gives it a much lighter, um, fresher sort of feel if there isn't that opaque whiteness on there. So it's always a goal for me to try and avoid that, but it's very easy to go too dark and get too heavy handed. So, you know, when you do need to save it, you just need to save it. And so you use whatever method you're going to have available to you to do that. 
<coughs> so I apologise again. The um, asthma and the sinus and everything is still playing up and um, playing havoc with my voice at the moment. So I've got some new medication to try, but it hasn't taken effect yet, so... Now I know that the next few days I'm not going to be able to do any recording because I've got my granddaughter coming and she'll be staying with me at school holidays here. And um, she's very noisy and she demands Granny's full attention so I'm not going to have much opportunity to sort of do social media properly for a few days. And so I thought I'd just sort of jump in here and do what I can for you um, while I have that opportunity and have the house to myself and it's quiet and I can concentrate. So that's just sort of very lightly a second coat of the same colour. Now I'm not treating this as a colour along because um, what colours I choose really does not matter. But um, more, uh, you know, it's more about how I lay the colour down and how I use the pencils. <coughs> and I'm not really um, trying to teach you how to do a portrait or give you a proper colour along. Now I've forgotten about her ears. So we'll just very lightly lay some colour down on her ears. Her lovely little fluffy, tufty ears. And we'll worry about sort of fine details later. Okay, so that's the first layer down. Next I would probably come in just a little bit warmer again. And I'm thinking that something like the burnt sienna so to just show, to slow things down and show how I do it, because I know that um, Candace has been saying she's had real trouble with them because she feels like they sit on the surface. Well, I don't colour onto the paper with them at all, or very rarely. And if I do, it's usually only small areas, but mostly I like to do this. I just like to take a little bit at a time when I'm doing a portrait onto the tip of the brush and this brush is, you know, releasing a decent amount of water with it. And I'm just doing a very, very light layer at a time. Just, just the tiniest, I don't know if you can see that, the tiniest bit of colour on that tip of the brush. You don't need a lot because the colour goes a long way. The Albrechtshire... Sorry, Albert Jura, that's another name that's difficult to stumble over. Um, the Albert Jura are very pigmented and their formulation, how they dissolve, is one of the best watercolour pencils that you can get. And so you don't need a lot of it to get, you know, some sort of result out of them. And... If you think about the concepts of watercolour painting, watercolour painting is about um, building light layers. Now, some watercolour painters do go in very vibrant and um, very bold to start with, but if you think about the more traditional style of watercolour painting, they're actually very, very soft and subtle and they're built up in light washes not heavy colour and so if you think about them in terms of that um, you know you might start to be able to see how these pencils come alive So where Christine has got the grey scale, 
that's where I'm doing it. Just that little gentle touch, a little bit of colour onto the tip of the brush. And you can see there I barely touched it. And that's a lot of colour coming out there. In fact, it's probably a bit too much. So I'll just dab a little bit back on my paper towel. And I'm just going to keep doing that to gently lift that back off again. Now, if you work in this way, these pencils will last a long time. I've had my set for um, many years. I don't know the date exactly when I got them, but I can tell you I won them in an art competition when I was uh, studying. And these were the first prize and I've had them, it's got to be 15 to 20 years maybe. And although I don't use them all the time, for a while there I was creating my own original art with them and working on some sort of decent sized pieces and I have not used up a pencil yet. In fact, my shortest pencil is the cream. And I've got, here's one that's full size. So you can see that the, you know, this is heavy use, the, the ivory, sorry, not cream. And that's the size difference. So, they're an expensive pencil, but they do go a very long way. And if you look after them, uh, they're going to see you through for a lot of creative work. I'm gonna use this color just to do a very light layer on her lips, just for the shadow area. And a little bit just there on that little bit after her chin and under her lip. Just, just the slightest. So I'm just going to have a look. Yeah, so you can see that I'm just really working really lightly, very subtly. Because it's a portrait. Now if I was doing something other than skin, I might go in bolder. But really the same concepts apply to whatever the subject is. Try to preserve some white or light areas. And if you can, just try and build your colour up slowly. And there's a little shadow there. And that is much too vibrant. So with a clean, clean brush, you just let that water pick the colour up and wipe it off on your paper towel. See, I'm still getting a lot of colour and I'm barely touching the brush to my pencil. Still need to do something here on the cheek area, a little bit in the ear. Now these might be a bit too subtle at the moment for you to be seeing a lot of change on camera. Um, my setup is that I can't really get you much closer at the moment. Now, I'm thinking I'll give her green eyes and I'm going to go for quite a light colour to start with. And this is light green and you might be able to see that I've been using this pencil quite a bit as well. And I tend to wear a little um, dent or 
depression in the pencil tip where I keep taking the colour from but I can use a lot of that before I have to sharpen it again. And the fact I'm not sharpening it very often means I'm not wasting very much either. And because I'm not using it as a pencil and pressing hard and breaking the tip, uh, it goes a long way as well. Now what I'm doing there is Christine has suggested some little light sources in the eye there, so I'm avoiding small areas to preserve that um, colour of the paper. I'm saying white of the paper, but this paper is actually quite cream. And then what I will do is when that is dry, I'm going to come back with a deeper colour which I'm going to use in this set is a pine green. And I'm just going to put a tiny bit there under the shadow of her eyelashes and a little bit around the edge of her iris. And because that paper is still damp, it's going to slightly bleed in, but that's okay because your eye hasn't got hard lines on it. Okay, now she looks like she's got um, lovely thick eyelashes there. So um, I'm not going to need to do too much with them. But what I will do is I want a grey with a bit of a bluish look about it. But I don't want it to be too dark. So I'm going to go for a cool grey or a cold grey. This is cold grey too. And I'm just going to put the slightest bit there on the whites of her eye under her eyelash line because that would be casting a, a little bit of a shadow over her white of the eye. And Christine has drawn a lot of that in here and the grayscale does indicate that. So that gives you a little tip, a little hint as well. And it means that you don't have to go too heavy handed with the, um, the colors yourself because Christine's already put that little tiny suggestion of it there for you. Okay. So that's how I would approach the eyes and I'm would possibly deepen the eyelash line up a little bit because um, the printing in this book, the ink isn't black black, but I'm not going to use black. I'm going to go for Payne's Grey, which is a very dark grey. And I'm just going to put a little suggestion there on the eyelid sort of eyelash line. And I'm not going to be tempted to make those eyelashes all thick and dark because um, in real life, unless someone's got a massive pair of eyelash face, false eyelashes on them, we don't see individual eyelashes like that. You just tend to see shadows or their eye makeup. And so I'm just going to lightly suggest a bit of extra dark there, but I'm not going to go mad and do all the eyelashes, especially not at this stage anyway. Um, with her green eyes and sort of warm uh, skin tone, I'm thinking that I'd like to go for either a nice pink or a sort of terracotta or warm brown lip. Um, I think I'll try terracotta to start with. And 
And again, um, Christine's already suggested where all the shadows are going to be. So I'm just going to lightly put colour in first because I can always put extra on later, but I can't take it away. So I'm going to try and preserve that little bit of white there for as long as I can at the moment. And I might introduce a little bit of that colour up here in, as if she's got a little bit of eye makeup on. Just where um, Christine's put the grey scale. And that's another reason you don't do your eyelashes yet. Because if you're going to put makeup on them, uh, make sure that you've done everything you're going to want to do before you go putting your eyelashes in. That will be the last thing to um, put on there if you feel like you need it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm still thinking uh, warmer again on her cheeks. So I'm going to use um, Caput Morton Violet, just the tiniest little dab in here. Now that's actually not a warm colour, that's got more of a cooler. Hint about it, so that's great for just the shadowed area. We'll come back to the burnt sienna for this other side. It doesn't look like it's such a deep shadow. And a little bit more around her nose. No shadows. And that looks a bit hard, so I'm going to soften that back up. With watercolour, you can put more water back onto something if you want to try and lighten it up and lift it off. There's, there are several techniques that you can use to do that with um, watercolour. Okay. So I'll do a little bit of the hair so you get an idea of the hair. And because she's a troll girl, I'm thinking a, a deeper brown. <coughs> so I'm going to start with walnut brown. And I'm going to try and think about which areas are behind and the areas that are coming forward, I'm going to leave light. So anything behind gets a little bit more colour and those that are forward, less, because that's what's going to be highlighted. Or if you think about it, the hair that is furthest away from your eye is slightly darker and then the hair that is forward or closer to your eye is going to be lighter. And again with this book Christine Karen has left lots of um, grayscale gray for us to help us make sense of that. So if you're new to a portrait um, Keep that in mind that this book is useful for learning about where shadows might fall. And 
and again it's just a process of starting lightly and feeling your way and when you're more confident that that's where you want it you can come back later and make it stronger if it needs to be or you know layer it with another extra color to make something a little bit different bring in a, a color from somewhere else around the page and because you can layer watercolor you've also got to be aware that if you come back you know with a yellow over a blue and put a wash of yellow over your blue base you are going to make a green look because it does um, show the colour underneath. Now once again, I'm not professing to be a expert at using these pencils and I'm also not professing that this is the only way to use them. But it is how I like to use them and enjoy using them and I've been asked to show how I use them to get the pictures that I'm, I'm posting on Instagram. So this is the process that I would go through if I wasn't recording for you. So I do know that there are many other ways to work with these pencils and you might actually feel that there are better ways or um, better results that can be gained and uh, I acknowledge that however there's something about working in this way with the pencil and the paint paintbrush that I find hugely relaxing it slows my mind down I do suffer a little bit with monkey mind where I um, can't switch my thoughts off sometimes. And this method of working, you know, I feel, I can feel myself slow down. I can feel my heart rate slow down. I can feel myself relaxing. And um, I forget about my worries for a while. I stop overthinking about things and just basically enjoy my creative time. And at this point of my life, that's what my hobby is about. It's about um, a little bit of self-care. Um, this time is for me to regain a little bit of a sense of um, peace and tranquility and I don't actually work outside of the home I don't have a full-time job I don't have a lot of commitments and um, stress like some people do but I do still have my stresses and um, I'm an overthinker and so what I've discovered over the many years of being a creative person is that this technique does wonders for just bringing a little bit of peace <coughs> and um, stillness to myself. And that's what I do, um, I, ju I jump around, I'm continuously moving around the picture. I don't just concentrate on one small area and get that right. Um, sometimes it's because, you know, you need to avoid wet paper 
and you need to sort of not be working on um, an area because you've got to let it dry. But it's also because um, I'm constantly assessing as I go around the um, paper, around the piece, um, have I got darker or lighter areas? Do I need to adjust anything? And um, that, that's the sort of little process that I've got myself into. And I'm not sure if I mentioned it on another video, I may have, but um, when I was learning how to do watercolour painting, <coughs> my watercolour teacher would just scratch his head and say, I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. And, um, you know, I didn't follow his instructions to the letter. And what I found was that um, this is what made sense in my head how to do it. And so I just kept doing it. And um, in the end, he'd say to me, well, look, if it works for you and you enjoy the result, keep doing it. And that's what I think about with colouring. I know that some people have strong opinions about the way things should be done and they're perfectly entitled to have those opinions. However, we don't all have to have that same opinion. And if you think that um, how I work doing it this way might be something you would like to do, then jump in and have a go. And if you like it, keep doing it. And if you don't, then perhaps find a tutorial or another artist who you can follow that you admire and um, see if you can learn something from the way that they work. Because um, one of the sort of things that we do when we first start doing something is we tend to mimic people we admire and it's great to study their methods and their style and see how you know if you can reverse engineer how they've done something and work out how might they have done that so that you can have a go yourself it's quite a useful learning tool in itself and I've found many a time that there have been artists that I greatly admire their work. And when I've had a go at, at doing it myself, um, I have no enjoyment in it at, at all. It's just that I admire and respect them and like to look at their work with no desire in the end to actually replicate that myself. But art is an interesting subject, it's an interesting um, activity, you know, and there's just so many different ways people interpret how to do things. Okay, so that's the first layer of the hair. And I'm hoping on the camera it shows up because I'm working very lightly. And then, um, of course, nobody's hair is just all one colour. So there's going to be um, some highlights and lowlights. And so now I'm going to start putting in some warmer tones in the areas where the light would hit, be hitting the most. Now, you could... Um, do your research by looking at photographs, Google some images on the internet and study the way that um, light falls on people's hair and how it affects their hair. 
and you could have that photo beside you for some reference to give you some hints on where to put the colour. Now this plait definitely will have, um, you know, a, a little bit more intensity because it, it's forward and it's also something a bit different in the picture. It's, you know, unique than the rest of her hair. So if you want to highlight it and bring it forward, you'd make something different about this compared to the rest of her hair. I mean, you could even sort of pretend that she's got an extra strand of ribbon or something in there and, and bring another colour into her hair. And so if you've never ever coloured a plait before, then Google a plait, Google plaited hair and have a look. I mean, there's so many images on the internet that we can look at. And then um, it gives you an idea of the placement of where the colours sit. So I'm getting the impression, like I'm get just, it's just a feeling that I want to make this side warmer and this side more shadowed. So um, I'm going to bring some cooler shades into that side and only have that plait that's warm. And to do that, I'm going to bring in, um, I think we might try, now you could have a um, page behind to protect your, your page. And I'm going to put one here that's going to be my scratch paper just to test colours. And I'm not liking that one. That's a possible. Now I will say the Abratura um, is a bit light on purples actually I think I might even bring in the Payne's grey mm, nah, it's a bit dull no scrap that idea I'll go for a bit of blue violet and I'll just see what that looks like and I'll only put it in a few areas first to see if I like it I'm not going to use that um, really solidly or dark. It's just a hint. It's just to take um, a little bit of the warmness to suggest the shadows. And then under her earring and ear over here, it would be. A little bit shadowed. I can actually hear a bit of rain outside. Nothing to get excited over yet, but. It's the first. Wet stuff falling from the sky for quite some time here. Okay, and I think I might put just a little touch of that over here as well. Now doing a demonstration on the video is actually a lot harder than um, then I, I realized, I mean, I thought it would be hard, but it's actually harder than I thought um, because 
I'm trying to explain to you why, why I'm making these decisions when I don't really know how to put them into words. It's just um, like an innate instinct now from years of um, colouring and art and studying and so on that I actually don't even sort of consciously think about why I'm choosing these things now. I'm just sort of doing it. And to actually stop and think and explain to you why I'm doing it is quite tricky. Now I'm going to bring in a bit more um, gold. So I'm going for the light yellow ochre and just bringing a bit more gold over here. And I'm going to bring a bit more gold up here. And this one that I've left for a highlight is really starting to stand out because it's got no colour on it at all. And I'm thinking, you know, she's a troll, troll girl, that um, her hair might not be the cleanest either. So um, I've got dark sepia here now that I'm going to start putting into some of the deepest areas. And bits where, you know, perhaps her hair might be a little bit ratty or grungy. Now so far the paper's coping with that quite well because I'm not saturating it. it, I'm not slopping the water on that, it's just really lightly being touched with the brush. And I still feel like over here is a little bit too Grab. So just that little bit of warmth over there as well. And while I've got that colour out, I'm going to put a little bit more in. Because what will happen is as you start getting the other areas around the face complete like the hair and the um, jewellery and the clothes and so on that's when you'll start to realise where you're going to need to deepen some shadows and get some extra colour into the, the subject's face. So uh, while that dries, I'll have a look at her outfit here. And it looks like it's something that might be made out of an animal skin or a leather. Um, so I'm going to go for... What have I got here? I think I might bring in a sanguine and then bring some browns and golds into it as well. So I'll bring a bit of burnt sienna in.
and also bring in the brown ochre. So I'm bringing all those colours in that are in her face, but with the um, colour of the sanguine, it's going to have a different feeling about it. And I'm going to use the lighter colour, which is brown ochre, for these edges that are rolled over here. Now I've done all of this so far with this one water brush. But of course, some of these smaller areas you might want to get yourself. Um, I've got a number of different brushes here that are very fine brushes, but they're old and they're getting very frayed now. But, um, you, you know, there's a number of different types of brushes that you can get that come to a fine point. Um, you can get synthetic um synthetic hair if you're not wanting to spend too much money on them. Um, that one, I don't even know where some of these came from now, but I do know that some of them I have spent more than others um, buying them. But it's good if you can find something that's a good enough quality that you can actually bring it to a point. And uh, I've got some really teeny tiny ones from when I used to paint portraits in watercolour years ago. Really, really teeny tiny ones. And that's what you could be doing some of these areas with until you get more comfortable using a brush. what I'm doing there is I'm thinking I just wanted to darken it a little bit underneath the lace that is going around there and so now I'm just lightly brushing that back to where I want it to be And not such a, a bulky, unwieldy line. It's more a gradual darkening of the colour. Please don't expect to be an expert overnight with um, brush techniques or how watercolour works because it is quite a study in itself to learn how to paint with watercolours and um, using a brush too is a learned, a learned skill I think some people are naturally talented at you know just about anything they pick up but um, a lot of you know most of us aren't and so it's a skill that needs to be practised and um, worked at rather than expecting to pick it up you know the first time that you use it anytime you feel like a color is too dark just wipe it back off your paper towel and come with the damp clean brush and lift some of it back off again or I'm just doing like a gentle patting motion of blending that in because I don't want hard edges.
Now, of course, I'm just picking colours that are here on these pencils and working with them. You can get yourself a palette or a plate and put some colours down together and mix the right shade um, for, you know, what you need. You don't have to just accept the colours that are there on the pencil and work with them. You can mix up your own colours. Now, obviously, you know, lots more is um, capable with a good watercolour palette or a, um, you know, set of watercolour tubes of paint and mixing your own colours, but that's a whole different animal. I'm just showing you purely if you've got a set of these and don't know how to use them that this is a way that you can get started and um, like everything else that I've talked about with you on videos it's a starting point and what you do with it from there is entirely up to you there's many things that can be done with them and I'm just purely showing you the way that um, I work with them because I'm comfortable with them this way and I enjoy using them this way and um, what I'm hoping to do by making these videos and chatting away to you is that you can start thinking huh, well I can do that I can experiment and have the confidence that when you're sitting there on your own with your with your books and your supplies that you might actually start looking at them a little bit differently and um, be much more open to exploring and finding your own solutions to the problems that you've got in your colouring because I can tell you all sorts of things. You can watch all sorts of tutorial um, videos and so on, and they're great value. I'm not saying don't do it, but um, the process of learning, um, you know, how to solve a problem in your creative hobbies and you actually finding the solution on your own and working it out is a um, much more valuable learned lesson, I, f I believe, I feel. You can get tips and trips, tricks and hints and so on, and that's great, um, but certainly don't stop actually doing that exploring for yourself and, and pushing it as far as you can for yourself. can see that as I darkened down here then I started to realize how pale and insipid it still is up there so it just can it just continues around until you get to that point where you're happy that um, when you're looking at it that you don't feel like you want to do any more with it You know, that, um, that process of that is ongoing and will keep going. So I think that might be long enough. Um, oh my gosh, I've been going much longer than I realised. And that, um, I'll let that dry fully and it will probably dry a bit lighter. So I'll come back and look at it at another time. Uh, before I decide what else I have to do with it but um, I'm going to lift that up and show that to you
So that's how she's looking so far. And I've been at this now for about 50 minutes or so. Um, so I feel like that's a really good start. And, um, you know, I would probably work a little bit faster if I wasn't thinking about how, I'll, how to put into words what I'm doing. But I think that's pretty good. And um, I might make this into a little series and come back to you with part two at another time. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope that that might give you some ideas, Candice, and anyone else who's been struggling with their Albert Jurors. And um, I will film part two where I progress a bit further with this one and be back with you again soon. Thank you for watching and bye for now.